Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is probably going to make you cringe so hard and wonder why the people in this case were so kind and gracious towards a man that frankly did not deserve it at all. But before we get into the details of this case, I want to help celebrate two sweet years of Love and Pies, one of my new favorite mobile games. Love and Pies is an adorable Merge 2 game that is having such a fun two weeks of exciting content, in-game events, and real-life baking contests that I am so excited for. In the game, Amelia is the protagonist where you play in a very wholesome world where you own your own cafe, you bake pies and cakes, you grow your business, and find romance in the most heartwarming way. Then you sprinkle in a little bit of chaos, small town gossip, and a bit of mystery. All together makes the perfect game to play at the end of a long day of work to unwind and relax, or when you're in the car and you need something to do, or when you're on a long plane ride like I was, just sitting there and playing it makes the time go by so fast. My favorite part of the game is getting to build your cafe and everything from scratch and all of the many Merge 2 games that you play to progress through your business. You should download Love and Pies right now to join in on all of the two-year birthday fun. There is so much happening within the next few weeks. Grab your two-year anniversary birthday cake statue for free to commemorate the anniversary. Or you can join the Bake Out Bash on the official Love and Pies Facebook and Instagram pages where you stand the chance to win amazing prizes in their community contest. I want to see what amazing creations you all can come up with. Come on and join the amazing anniversary celebrations and install Love and Pies. It is free on iOS and Android and you can join me in making this celebration truly unforgettable. Thank you again so much to Love and Pies for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case at hand. 59-year-old Chad Amato was married to 61-year-old Margaret Amato. Margaret already had a son named Jason when she met Chad, and after they were married, Chad adopted Jason when he was three years old. By 1987, the couple had their first biological child together, a son named Cody, and two years later, they had their youngest son, Grant. Chad worked as a pharmacist at CVS Health, and he was known for loving computers, dubbing himself as a self-taught computer guru. Meanwhile, Margaret worked as a senior operations manager at Nuance Transcription Services, which was a company for medical coding. Margaret was known for her love of horses. She spent a lot of her time at Miracle Lane Stables, tending to an ex-racehorse that she rescued in 2009. She was described as being kind and gentle with a sweet, caring soul. The family lived together in a beautiful home in Cholatoa, Florida. They had a big four-bedroom home on 2.9 acres of land, and just before Chad and Margaret's death, they had bought a second home in Tennessee, which they planned on moving to after retiring. The Amato family was known as being a tight-knit family who loved football and never missed a Florida Gators game. Grant and his older brother, Cody, were known as being very close growing up. They were basically best friends. They attended Timber Creek High School in Florida, and both were a part of the school's weightlifting team. When the two graduated high school, they both went to nursing school at the University of Central Florida with the hopes of becoming nurse anesthetists. The two graduated nursing school and started working as nurses at Advent Health Orlando Hospital before trying for their anesthetists' licenses. At the time, Cody and Grant were still living with their parents, while Jason moved out of the family home and was living in Winter Springs, working as a mortgage loan underwriter. Cody thrived at his nursing job. He loved it, and his patients loved him. His co-workers said that he was such a pleasure to work with, adding that his smile and laugh always made the shift easier. Others said that Cody was really good at handling the stresses that came with the job. They said that no matter the situation, Cody was able to stay cool, calm, and collected. When Cody went for his anesthetist license, he took the course and passed. However, things were not quite as easy for Grant. He struggled big time. He didn't do well at his job, and when he went to get his anesthetist license, he failed. Then, by June of 2018, it came out that Grant was stealing drugs from work and improperly administering medications to patients. 
the main drug that Grant stole was propofol. Propofol is a drug that is used to slow the activity of your nervous system and brain or put you asleep while undergoing some sort of surgical or other medical procedure. It's pretty much exclusively used by anesthesiologists. But after the evidence came out of Grant stealing the propofol, he was arrested for grand theft. At the time, Grant was asked by police why he was improperly giving this drug to patients, and he said that he gave it to patients who he believed were not being treated properly for pain management. Now, although Grant was arrested, the hospital failed to follow through on pressing charges, so he was never actually charged with anything. Despite this, though, Grant was obviously fired from his job. After being fired from his job, Grant started looking for new nursing jobs. But as you can imagine, no hospital wants to hire a guy that was just fired for stealing from them. So, he spent a lot of time just at home, by himself in his bedroom, messing around on his computer. As the time passed, Grant isolated himself more and more, and he became increasingly depressed. He would stay up all night on his computer, gaming and live streaming. Then, he would sleep all day. As his mental health deteriorated, so did his physical health. He stopped eating, so he lost a ton of weight. He looked exhausted all of the time, with dark bags forming under his eyes. His skin turned pale, and he looked sickly. However, even though Grant was 29 years old and jobless, living with his parents, driving an old 1996 Honda Accord, online, he portrayed himself in a completely different persona. He made a group of online gaming friends, and to them, he portrayed himself as a wealthy bachelor who had his own place and drove around in a BMW. Not only did he portray himself that way, it seemed that he also thought of himself as much wealthier than he was as well. While spending so much time online by June of 2018, Grant started visiting various pornographic streaming websites where you can pay women to watch them on webcams. Eventually, Grant visited the website Cam Girls and found himself obsessed with watching one specific woman from Bulgaria named Sylvia Ventisis Lvova. I'm so sorry if I'm saying that last name wrong. There's a lot of letters. I might have just butchered that, but either way, it got to the point where Grant was watching her every night for several hours per night. He would pay up to 5,000 tokens, which ended up being around $600 every night to watch her. Not long after that, Grant began sending her gifts like expensive clothes and sex toys, and even started viewing her as his girlfriend, giving her the nickname Sylvie. Obviously, Sylvia did not see Grant in that way, but she always showed her appreciation for the money and gifts that she received from him. Then, Grant started sending her videos of himself, talking to her, and asking her for free content. He basically said, like, I feel weird when I pay for your videos. Can you please just send me something for free? Just begging for free videos. It was really creepy and weird. All right, Sylvia, look at me. I am, I am outside going to check the mail. And I'm asking you if you can please, pretty please, send me one of your videos. I just, I, I love it so much when you just send them to me. Yeah, I, I don't like buying your stuff. It makes me feel weird. Could you please send me one though? It turned out that over the course of three months, Grant had spent $200,000 on Sylvia in three months. $200,000 in three months. Now, as you could have guessed, the money that Grant spent on Sylvia was not his to spend. It came from his father and his brother. He had stolen upwards of $150,000 from his parents, which included a $65,000 loan that he took out on the house in Chad's name. Then he took a sum of $50,000 from his brother, Cody. He also stole Cody's guns and sold them without his permission as well. Eventually, after stealing so much money from his family, they did obviously find out, 
but they were very, very forgiving. Grant told his family that he was using all of this money to promote his gaming on the live streaming website, Twitch. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with Twitch, but for those of you who don't know, gamers will stream on Twitch, and if they get enough of a following, people will start paying them to watch their streams, or sometimes people just do those little donations during the stream to support the gamer as they're watching. There are a few people out there who have made quite the living off of Twitch, so that's probably what he was telling his family, that he was working hard to make it on Twitch and one day he could make a lot of money doing that. For a few weeks after they found out about this absurd amount of money, things were relatively calm in the family. They were, again, very forgiving and were really hoping that Grant was going to clean up his act and was going to use the money to make something of himself and get a job. Things stayed like that for a few months. Then, in December of 2018, Cody took Grant and another friend on a big trip all the way to Japan. Cody covered all of Grant's expenses for the trip, and all three men had a really great time. The family thought that maybe a nice break from life as they knew it could bring back up Grant's spirits, and that once he came back, he would get his life back on track, he would be refreshed from being away for so long, and would be ready to buckle down and get to work. But that isn't what ended up happening. Grant wouldn't get another job. He stayed at home, and wouldn't get off his computer. It got to the point that his family was absolutely fed up with Grant and they could not take it anymore. Chad and Grant fought pretty much every day about Grant's behaviors and lifestyle and it just got out of control for everybody in the home. By December 20th, 2018, Grant got fed up with all of the fighting so he just left the home without saying anything. Margaret watched him drive away, and after a short while, she got a text from Grant saying that he's tired of everything and is going to handle everything in his own way. This text really concerned his mother, Margaret, because she knew that he was depressed. She knew that he had feelings of worthlessness, and he also had access to firearms that were on the property. And again, he had stolen that gun from his brother to sell, so they didn't put it past Grant to have stolen another gun. So, afraid that he was going to harm himself, Margaret reported him as a missing person. But not long after he left, Grant's grandmother, Donna, had called the family to let them know that he was at her house located in Apopka, Florida, about 42 miles away from the family home. So, this put the family at ease that Grant wasn't in harm's way and that maybe he was just going over there to get away for a little bit. But after Grant got to Donna's house, she immediately noticed suspicious activity on her bank account. And this time, it was clear that it was coming from the Cam Girls website. So, as soon as she found this out, she called Chad to let him know what was going on. After it came out what Grant was really up to, because at this point, I don't think he was actually using the bank accounts to pay for the Cam Girls. I'm really not sure, but it seemed that Chad and Margaret didn't know what he was really spending the money on. But now, obviously... They knew exactly what he was doing, and they figured that this is what he had been doing the whole time. But either way, after finding out what happened, Grant and Chad both asked Donna not to press charges, and Grant promised her that he was going to pay her back. By December 22nd of that year, Chad, Margaret, and Cody all drove to Donna's house to stage an intervention for Grant. They told him that his behaviors were absolutely out of control and that he needed help for his sex and pornography addiction. So, they picked him up and he headed to a rehab center in Fort Lauderdale where Grant enrolled in a 60-day program for sex and porn addiction. While there, Chad went on Grant's computer to get into contact with Sylvia and let her know that Grant was stealing from his family to talk to her. Basically telling Sylvia that he's not this bachelor who has a BMW, he's 29, unemployed, and stealing from his family. Then, Chad changed the password on Grant's computer so that Grant could no longer use it without Chad's permission. Now, the rehab program cost the family another $15,000, but that didn't phase Grant. He only spent two weeks in the program before he dropped out on January 5th, 
Cody was the one who ended up paying for this. After dropping out, the family allowed Grant to come back and live in the home, but they held a family meeting where they gave him a new set of rules, which his father wrote down for him clearly on a notepad. He had to get a job, he needed to stop spending so much time online, no going on the internet after midnight, he needed to go to therapy, and he needed to pay his family back for all of the money he owed them, and they would no longer be footing the bills for his activities. And the biggest rule of all, no more cam girls. If he was caught communicating with Sylvia again, he was going to be promptly kicked out of the house. At the meeting, Grant agreed to follow all of these new rules to stay in the home. So, for the three weeks that followed, according to Jason, the brother that wasn't living at home, the family seemed to be under the impression that Grant was applying for jobs and was following the new rules set in place by Chad. That was until January 24th, 2019. It turned out that Grant had not stopped communicating with Sylvia. According to Grant, he didn't think that it was fair that he had to stop communicating with her because he saw her as his girlfriend, and he said that the two had a relationship that he didn't want to break. He continued to message her on Twitter, and on the 24th of January, Chad found out about it. Earlier that day, Grant said that he had been preparing for a job interview, but then he found out that his dad found out about his ongoing communication with Sylvia. That evening at around 5 p.m., Chad came home from work absolutely livid about his complete disregard for the rules. Chad confronted Grant about continuing to talk to Sylvia, and at that point, Chad told Grant that he was out of the house. He continued arguing with his father while Grant packed up his things into his car to leave. That same night at around 9.15 p.m., Cody had been at work when he received a call from Grant telling him about the situation and asking him to come home. Cody had actually worked with his girlfriend at his nursing job, so after Cody got the call, his girlfriend asked him what it was about and he was visibly upset. He said stupid effing bullshit before he left work to go home. According to Grant, once Cody got home, Grant left the house so Cody could help smooth things over with their parents. At the same time, by 9.43 p.m., Cody's girlfriend texted him asking him if everything was okay and he replied that things were fine and not to worry about him. After that, she hadn't heard from Cody for the rest of the night. By that following morning on January 25th, Cody's coworkers at the Advent Hospital became concerned when he did not show up as normal for his work shift. They knew that Cody was very responsible, a very diligent worker who would never just no-call, no-show into work. In fact, he hadn't missed a day of work in five years. They tried calling and texting Cody, but nobody got an answer. When calling, they noticed that Cody's phone was going straight to voicemail, which meant that his phone was off, but this was very odd to coworkers because his phone was never turned off. So, his coworkers called Chad, who did not answer. Then, they tried calling Margaret, but she also was not answering. So they tried Jason, their brother that didn't live with them, and he did answer. Cody's work told Jason that they weren't able to get a hold of him and asked if he had heard from him, and he said no. So he tried to call his family as well, but he also wasn't able to get a hold of anybody. By that point, Cody's coworkers were really concerned for his safety, so they called 911 to report him as missing. In the 911 call, the coworker told the dispatcher that Cody's brother, Grant, had struggled with depression and it was getting worse in the recent weeks. She said that she didn't want to assume the worst, but made it clear that she was very worried about Cody. Oviedo Police Department on the recorded line, this is Tara. Hey, Kara, my name is I work at OMC downtown. Um, I'm an anesthesia uh, provider down here. Um, I got an employee that uh, has never missed a day of work in about five days. His phone is off. Um, his brother also works here at the hospital. His phone has been disconnected. Um, I was wondering how I go about doing a wellness check on him just to make sure he's okay. We can send an officer out to the location. Do you know where he lives? His name is Cody, C-O. D-Y, last name Amato, A-N-A-T-O. 
he lives at that residence with his brother. Um, last time he was here last night at 9.15, he left the hospital. He knew he was supposed to be at work today. Um, again, he's never missed a day of work in like five years, and um, he's always got his phone on. His phone has been turned off, and his uh, message box is full. So nobody can get a hold of him. He tried um, you know, all the social media outlets and all that. And he's supposed to be here at, uh, he only gets here about 5.30 in the morning. All right, I'm going to have them call you after they're done um, going out there to check on him. When they call you, it's going to show up as an unknown blocked or restricted number, okay? Perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate all you guys do. No problem. Thank you. By 9-17 on the morning of January 25th, officers arrived to the address where Margaret, Chad, Cody, and Grant all lived. They checked all of the doors and windows, which were all locked. They tried knocking and eventually using an air horn to announce themselves, but still, they got no response. So, deputies decided to enter the house by breaking the deadbolt to the back door to do their wellness check. When they walked in, an officer immediately saw a man lying on his back on the kitchen floor, surrounded by a pool of blood. Then, they entered the area where the garage was, which led directly into the home gym, and right in that doorway, they found another man lying dead on the floor, this time in the fetal position with blood coming out of his eyes. Then they went downstairs to the home office and there they found a woman slumped over the desk, still in the office chair with blood all over her face. Of course, these three victims were identified as being Chad, Cody, and Margaret. Margaret had been shot once in the back of her head. She was found slumped over at her desk again, right next to an empty glass of wine. It was thought that she was shot first and that she was shot while she was working, completely unaware that somebody was right behind her with a gun pointed at her head. She was shot in very close range. Chad had been shot twice in the head. Upon inspection, it looked like Chad had been shot once while he was standing by the cabinets in the kitchen, and then again while he was lying on the floor next to the island in the kitchen. It looked like he was still alive when he was shot the first time, so he tried getting away, but he was shot again shortly after. When Chad's body was found again lying on his back on the kitchen floor, they saw that he still had a gun in his belt holster. Now, this could mean two things. This could mean that he was shot as soon as the perpetrator entered the house before Chad got a chance to unholster his weapon. Either that or the perpetrator placed that gun holster on his hip to make it look like Chad was carrying. It has been said that he didn't normally carry his gun holster around, so it could have been placed there after he was shot to make it look like there was some sort of other confrontation but I'm not 100% sure which is the true scenario. Cody was found to have been shot in the face, directly between his eyes. He was found curled up on the ground with his scrubs still on from his shift that previous night. Like I said, he was found right in the doorway from the garage that led into the home gym. But when they got to the scene, the door to the garage, so not like the big door, but like the one that lets you in the home where Cody was found, that door had actually been shut. Police saw that there was blood on the door frame as well as the door jam, which told them that the door was actually open when Cody was shot. Next to Cody, police found a 9mm handgun. They thought that maybe it was placed there to make it look like Cody was the one who murdered his parents before turning the gun on himself. But pretty much right away, they knew that this wasn't the case. Again, they knew based on the blood evidence on the door frame that the door was open when Cody was shot. There would have been no way for him to close that door after he was shot and there is no way that the door could have closed itself. It had to have been manually opened by somebody else. Then, if that wasn't enough, the gun found by Cody wasn't even the same gun that was used to murder each member of the family. So whoever put it there didn't seem to know anything about guns. It was the same caliber gun, but the marks on the bullets that came from that gun did not match the marks on the bullets that were found at the scene. Then, when the autopsy was performed, the medical examiner determined that based on the injuries that Cody had, 
it appeared that he was shot from a bit of a distance. Obviously, with a self-inflicted gunshot wound, you would expect it to be from a very close range, but it wasn't. That says that somebody else had to have shot him. Now, based on police's prior knowledge of that household, they knew that a fourth person lived in that home and he was nowhere to be found. So, they looked around the house, the garage, and the driveway, and they saw that the three cars that belonged to the three victims were all parked there, but Grant's 1996 white Honda Accord was missing. After finding the bodies, officers then went to talk to Jason again to see if he knew of anybody who could want to hurt his family. And that is when police learned about all of that money that Grant had stolen from his father and his brother how he had lost his job, he was depressed, and he went to rehab. They learned about how once he returned home, if he broke those rules, he would be kicked out. Then he said that during the time that all of this was happening with the intervention and going to rehab, apparently Cody told his girlfriend that he was afraid that Grant was going to kill everybody. Obviously, this was very concerning to the police, especially given the fact that he was not present at the home when all the bodies were found. So, police used the license plate on Grant's Honda to try to track where he was going, where he had been, to hopefully find him and take him in for questioning. By the following day, on January 26th, police located his car in the parking lot of a Doubletree Hotel in Orlando. And when police checked with the hotel staff, they learned that Grant was in fact staying there. So by 9.30 a.m. that day, they went to his room where he voluntarily left with police and went into the station with them to be questioned. So, during his interview with police, Grant spoke in a very nonchalant, casual way. The tone in his voice is like he's just telling a story of how he sees things. And I honestly really like how investigators are speaking with him at first because they totally have him believing that they agree with him. That they're just shooting the shit, that Grant is the best salesman they've ever heard. They start blaming Chad for things that Grant's talking about. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Until it gets to the small details that matter when they're trying to figure out exactly what happened. After about two hours of talking with police, the investigators start really pushing him and putting pressure on him and start calling out his bullshit. Now, in the interview, Grant admitted that he had a very heated argument with his father on the night of January 24th. He explained that the argument was over the money that he had spent talking to Sylvia and that he was being kicked out because he wasn't supposed to be communicating with her anymore. But again, this woman that he was paying $200,000 to was his loyal girlfriend, so it only made sense that he continued talking to her because he didn't want to break his heart or her heart. Anyways, he said that during the argument, his mother was still in the office, while again, Cody was at work before he made it back home. So, it was really only him and his father who were arguing. And sort of just to put a little bit of a timeline on this, Chad got home at around 5, so it seemed like they were arguing and Grant was packing up his stuff and things were happening for about four hours before Grant got home at around nine. While arguing, Grant said that Chad told him that if he ever stepped foot back on his property, that he would kill him. He said that his father would often lose his temper on everybody in the house, especially his mother. Grant said that he was scared of his father because he had been overbearing and emotionally and verbally abusive from the time that him and Cody were kids. He said that he was tired of being blamed for everything, saying that Chad blamed everything on him, even for the small things. When I got back, that's where my dad started to get really kind of overbearing. and I mean, rightfully so. I know what I did. But... It's like with him, it was every single day, hours a day, <clears throat> excuse me, hours a day, he'd come home from work and then he would just talk to me just about the same exact thing over and over and over and over and over again. And did, it, he, get, did he get heated? He would get heated, but... He, How about you? Did you get heated? No, I mean, I was, you know, I, I was always the person in the family where, like, my brother Cody would interrupt my dad when he was talking. Uh, my mom would interject and say, you can't be saying that or whatever. But for me, I would just sit there and I would just let my dad talk so that he could say everything that he wanted to say. Um, to all this, you think you were in the wrong? I mean, yeah. To I mean, some, some extent? To some extent. You know, uh, spending that amount of money, it's 
idiotic to do that, you know, especially so when you're not making so two hundred thousand. Right. So yeah, anyways, on Thursday, he had apparently found out that I was speaking to her again, mm -hmm. and when I came back on the fourth, me, my mom picked me up from the Cornerstone place, and then me and my mom met my dad at California Pizza Grill or Kitchen in Waterford Lakes, mm -hmm. and he had this list front and back on a piece of paper of all the rules, this is what's going to happen, this is why I'm acting the way that I'm going to act, I'm not going to be dad anymore, I'm going to be Chad. And I basically told him that I'm going to be, I'm going to be present, I'm going to do what I can, I'm going to start trying to get jobs now. I told him what my plan was, you know, it wasn't really my intention to continue talking to this woman, but it just kind of happened. And then because there was like that emotional connection, I guess you could say, uh, between her and me, like I, I like, you know, it felt like, like, like a relationship, you know, I didn't want to just stop cold turkey on it. So he had apparently found out and then, one of the, happy. right, and one of the stipulations was that he told me at the dinner was, if you speak to this woman again, you're out of the house, like, I'm mm -hmm. kicking you out, you can pack up your shit and then you're off my property. And then because of the way that he used to be, he had told me that basically if that happens, that if I ever step back onto his property, that he would kill me. I don't know how he found out, but he had apparently found out and then... Found out what? That I was talking to, you were still talking to the woman, yeah. And then uh, he came in and then he asked me in a calmer state, I guess you could say, like basically the, the leading question of, you know, why do you think we're about to have this conversation? Giving me, I guess, that opportunity to be honest and truthful to maybe tone it down a little bit. I, of course, did what I always did, where I kind of didn't admit to it. Uh -huh. um, and then he, he came out and he told me that I had been doing that. He had proof. Yeah. Um, have an argument? Yeah. He had kind of reverted back to the way that he was when we were younger, uh -huh. where, you know, he kind of you know, pulled me up from the couch, and then he was yelling at me to pack my shit up and just get out of the house, that he was the one who had to be the hammer, and that, you know, why am I making him have to go through this, and all this other kind of stuff. Okay. I like, mean, like the way you described right, it when you, were, right. when, you were, when you were Cody with kids. Right. What did he do? Um, like I said, he pulled me up from the couch just by, like, the shirt that I was wearing, mm -hmm. and then, you know, after that, he was basically just having that yelling where it was kind of kind of like cracking, you know, like his voice would either crack or he would just, he was basically just yelling at that point and monitoring, Where's like, your mom? my mom was in her office. You have your argument and you pack your stuff? I have my argument and then I'm packing my stuff, I'm, you know, taking it out to the car, it took me like a couple hours to get as much as I could just kind of out into there. And then, yeah, it's like mom's kind of just staying out of it to a certain degree because she knows like how dad can be. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I was, and that's just pretty much where I was just kind of like waiting. Like two weeks before I got kicked out, my dad was going through like a lot of episodes where he was losing his temper a lot, yelling a lot, especially when me and Cody weren't at the house. And, um, who's he yelling at? My mom. So was he being violent to your mom? Yeah, like, I think. Physically or just emotionally? Both. Put his hands on her. He had bruised her left arm by grabbing it, um, and then apparently she had said that on one of the nights that um, they were in the kitchen together, and then he was, like, throwing food at her and then banged her head against the wall a couple times. So, and I'm not, let me speak bad of your dad, but he's kind of a violent guy. He's, yeah, I mean. You have a reason to be afraid of him. And then the thing that I was getting to was that apparently my mom was so scared at one point, because it had been a while since he had been like this. He had told her that if you, or he had told her that basically if I fuck up, sorry for the language, but if, that if I if I screw up, he's gonna kill me, and then he's gonna kill her. He said those specific because words. he blames everything that happens negatively with me and with Jason, not with Cody, but with me and Jason on her because we're her so, favorites. So you have a reasonable belief in your mind that your dad could could hurt you. Yes. He could hurt your mom. Yes. He could maybe hurt Jason. Yes. He's a violent guy. I'm sorry, I've been this a long time. He sounds like a violent guy. Yeah. Quick to lose his temper with you over minuscule stuff. Minuscule stuff. Yeah. I get the point. He's upset about the amount of money. I do right, get that. Right. 
But physically, he's abusive. Yeah. And it's kind of embarrassing as you're an adult male right now. He's been abusive of you for years, has he not? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, more more mentally over the but, course. But yeah. it has been to the point where you as a 29-year-old male, right, 29? 29. That you're afraid that your father could kill you. Yeah. Then, Grant said that on the night of the argument, he said that Chad gave him his credit card and said to go to a hotel for the night. Once Cody got home, the two spoke for a bit before Grant left at around 12 to 12.30 a.m. He didn't immediately go to the hotel, though. He went to a local Publix and he took his car there and slept in his car overnight before going to the hotel that following day. At the same time, Cody stayed at home and smoothed things out with the parents. He said that the next morning on January 25th, Grant was on his way back to the neighborhood with the intention of returning home, but he made the snap decision not to. Police asked him if he saw anything out of the ordinary that made him turn around, and he said no. But investigators told him that around the same time he claimed to be returning back home, there were ambulances, police cars, and news vans all parked outside of his house. So it was very strange if he had returned back to the neighborhood and didn't see anything strange because there was a lot of strange things going on at that time. Grant really didn't have any answers for any of this. Eventually, he told investigators that that morning he had gone to a local Panera Bread restaurant where he went on their public Wi-Fi and he was browsing through their news stories. He said that that is when he saw that there was a shooting in his neighborhood. He said that in one of the news videos, he saw a fence that looked like it could be his house, so he got really worried. But when investigators asked him why he didn't reach out to his family to see if they were okay, he said that he didn't want to know. He was really worried about his family's well-being, but he was too scared to find out what really happened. When I looked at the site, I, I did not, I, I only saw a small blurb. So when did you learn that your family was dead? I had been worried since last night when I was uh, just in the hotel, but I knew when you guys told me. I mean, like, I knew when you guys had told me. You already knew, though. But I had... You already said... You knew. At any point, did you feel like you needed to reach out to Cody and see if he was okay, or...? I just didn't want to call anywhere. I just didn't want to know. But then, investigators started pulling out the photos and showing Grant of how each body was found and confronted him with the evidence. They asked Grant who could have had the motive and told them that Jason didn't do it, he had an alibi. Cody didn't do it, again, based on the evidence that we discussed earlier about the door being shut after Cody's death, as well as the ME saying that his wound could not have been self-inflicted. There was nobody else that could have been responsible. But even with that, Grant stayed solid, saying that he did not do it. Then Grant's brother, Jason, came in to talk to Grant. Basically, Jason said that he wanted to believe Grant, but things weren't adding up. He begged for him to tell him what was really going on, but still, Grant would not budge. All right, so uh, I, I take it you know what happened. I just, I'm going to ask you plain out, you, you are not part of it in any way? No. How, when's the last time you saw everybody? Uh, I left the house between like uh, midnight and like 12.30. On Thursday night? So Friday Thursday morning? Thursday going to the front. Why? Just, just, that's when you went to a hotel? No, no, the first night I, uh, I stayed just in the public parking lot by the tractor supply. Okay, and why did you leave, though? His big dad had kicked me out on a Thursday because I was still talking to the woman that had caused everything. So then dad found out somehow. Uh, and that was one of the things that he had said would lead to my being removed from the premises. 
So he forced you, he basically told you you had to leave? Yeah. Okay. So who could have done this? I don't know. I don't... So you didn't have any problems or troubles with this woman or the online? You didn't owe no. him any money? No. I mean, there's no. no, like, loan shark out looking for you or... No. I, mean, I just don't see how things aren't adding up. I just... I'm really confused, Grant. I don't understand. I don't know. I I want to believe you, Grant, but you're the last person that I could put in that house. And I know what happened over the last six months. I can understand the troubles that you've gone through. But it's hard for me to think that you would break to this point. Mm -hmm. But I don't... I, who else can I blame? Who? How are we going to find out who did this? I don't know. I don't have the answers. So what are your intentions? Do you understand what we have to do now? If you're not the person that did it, we have months of stuff that we have to take care of from our dead parents. Months. Months. You know how much stuff is in that house? We have to go through it all. I have to call people in California to let them know that Margaret Amato is not alive anymore. I gotta call at 3 o'clock in the morning because Cody's 30 years old and has perfectly good organs to donate. And I can't, I can't call that shot. He's not an organ donor. I had to say no. So that means there's someone out there that could have used his organs, but we weren't prepared for this. I love you more than anything in this world, just like I loved Cody, Grant, and Dad. I know Dad was an asshole. I know Cody was an asshole. But they were our family, and they would have never done anything to hurt us. Mm -hmm. The shit you did, you could have been in jail. You would have been in jail for years. I know. And they covered it up for you. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't. I don't believe you. And I probably will have resentment for the rest of my life, whether you did it or you didn't do it. But I need closure. I need to know what happened to my mother, my father, and my brother Cody, because I wasn't there to fucking help. And that hurts me. That hurts me a lot, man. I may not have been able to stop you. You probably may have hurt me too. But at least I would have known what happened. And now I'm in fucking who knows what now. I am lost. And it scares me that you want to leave here and not face what happened. Because... You're putting my life at risk then. You're putting Donna's life at risk, Grandma's life. How do we know what you're going to do? You know, I know what I did to everybody over the months. And okay. Like that. I know you did. And I know that you know the hell of dealing with it every single day when you're trying to move forward. Yep. With Dad I, and Cody and all that stuff. Yep. And I understand it was probably harder for you because you lived in the house. I had the option of getting out which gave me the ability to not have to deal with it on a daily basis. I understand the sh mental struggles you went through with Cody and Dad's relationship, you and Dad's relationship, everybody's relationship in the family. You know how smart everybody is in the family when it comes to medical information. And that's what scares me even more about you. If you didn't do it, then you have to know that someone else did it. There is no way that there were people out there looking for our parents or brother. They had to have been looking for you. There's no way that mom, dad, or Cody owed anybody money, had anybody sh looking for them because of something that they did. No, I don't think that it's some money shark or monger or somebody like that. Right, because nothing was stolen from the house. Right. So, like, people that are looking to compensate for financial obligations would have taken TVs, computers, 
jewelry, monetarily things. Right. From what I've been advised, that is not the situation. So that leaves that the people were murdered for the reason that they were in the way of getting to something else. I just, I don't understand why, I don't understand why it happened. I was taking my steps forward despite everything that I was supposed to do, that I was supposed to be doing. The slip up was still communicating with the woman. I don't know what else to say, but I'm scared for you and I'm scared for myself and I don't feel comfortable with you being around me alone. I'm sorry. Like I said, pretty much the entire interrogation, Grant did not show much emotion at all. He showed a little bit when he was shown the photos of his dead family members, but he maintained his composure pretty much the entire time. Now, despite the story that Grant was giving to investigators, saying that he was innocent, not wanting to budge on his story, police did not believe him one bit. So, by January 28th, 2019, Grant was arrested and charged with three counts of premeditated first-degree murder. He pled not guilty, and while awaiting his trial, he was given a $750,000 bail which he was not able to make. Grant's trial for murder started on July 23rd, 2019. The prosecution argued that Grant was the only one who could have murdered his family. He had the motive, the means, the opportunity. It wasn't a random home invasion or a robbery gone wrong. There was no sign of forced entry, no valuables stolen, no sign of any struggle. They said that Grant had been stealing money, he was jobless, he was depressed, and had no prospects. He started using that cam girl's website, and he became absolutely obsessed with Sylvia, with whom he believed to be in a relationship. They said that after he was ordered to stop talking with her, he blamed his parents for ending his relationship. When Chad found out about him continuing this relationship with Sylvia, he threw him out of the house. Grant then responded by murdering his entire family. The prosecution talked about a letter that they found, which was written by Grant at some point between his rehab stint, so coming out of rehab, and before the murders took place. This letter was supposed to go to the internet friends that he had met, who were also men who watched Sylvia on Cam Girls. He basically talked about how much he loved Sylvia, but he was furious at his father. Again, while he was at rehab, Chad messaged Sylvia and told her that Grant was not this rich bachelor with the BMW and his own place. Grant was unemployed, living at home, and was stealing money. Grant said that he felt like his heart had been ripped out of his chest after he found that out. He said that he realized how pointless life is without her in his life. He fell in love with her, and he was obsessed with her, to say the least. He felt that the only thing that got in the way of him being with Sylvia was his family, so he killed them. The prosecution explained the detailed timeline of events that led up to the murders as well. They explained that Grant was home most of the day with his mother, who was working from home. They said that he was on his computer up until 4.44 p.m. on January 24th. They thought that Grant probably murdered her first at this time at around 4.45 p.m. by shooting her in the back of the head as she sat at her desk. Then at 5.25 p.m., Chad's phone indicated that he had made it home. The prosecution believes that Grant shot Chad right as he entered the home. Again, one of the possibilities is that he had a gun of his own, but he didn't get the chance to unholster it before he was killed. So it seems that Grant found out at some point before Chad got home that Chad was very upset and he was going to be arguing with Grant about the fact that he was messaging Sylvia. Then the prosecution argued that Grant waited for Cody to get home. If you recall from earlier, Cody got a call at 9.15 p.m. to come home because they had been arguing. It appears that he was walking into the home through the garage before he was shot in the face immediately. Again, he didn't even make it into the home. 
he was lying at the entrance of the garage with his feet outwards towards the garage and his face towards the workout room, which shows that he was entering the home, not leaving. They argued that over the course of four hours, he shot each of his family members one by one. He sat with his mother's body in the house for an hour before Chad got home. Then he waited another three hours for his brother to get home as the bodies of his parents were in the home with him, in the kitchen with him where he could see his father lying there. Then he put the gun by Cody's body after shooting all of them in a fruitless attempt to make it look like a murder-suicide. They said that this was just about as brutal and violent and cold as it gets. Now, to continue the timeline, at 11.32 p.m. that same night, a flash drive with over 600 photos of Sylvia was inserted into Grant's computer in the home. The same flash drive would later be found in Grant's pocket. Then at 11.39 p.m., they found that Cody's iPhone had been connected to Grant's computer, but the person trying to access it didn't know the passcode, so the phone was put into recovery mode. This told investigators that the person on the phone was attempting to wipe it clean. Then it also shows that Grant was at home in the middle of the night at the same time that he said that he left. Now, investigators also noted that when they found Chad's body, the index finger had less blood on it than the rest of his hand and fingers. This told them that the index finger had been wiped clean to clean off the blood. At 12.08 a.m., going into January 25th, investigators found that Chad's USAA banking app was accessed using his fingerprint. They said that it was possible for a deceased person's fingerprint to be used to gain access to a phone, so obviously it looked like Grant had wiped his father's finger off, picked up the hand of his father's dead body, and used it to access his money. By 2.45 a.m., it showed that Grant's computer accessed Wi-Fi at a local public store. Again, like Grant said in his interview earlier, and also confirmed by surveillance cameras, it was shown that Grant drove to the same Publix that he accessed the Wi-Fi from and slept in his car there. Well, at 3.06 a.m., it showed that while connected to the Publix Wi-Fi, Grant paid $600 to reopen his cam girl's account. What a dude. Worried about porn when he shot every member of his family in the home. Now, the murder weapon that was used in the killings was actually never recovered. But the prosecution brought forward a witness who was a friend of Grant and Cody's named Blake to talk about what he thought may have happened. He said that he noticed his 9mm handgun had been stolen from his bedroom closet. Blake said that he never really used this gun, so he didn't notice it was missing for quite some time. As soon as he did realize it was missing, he reported it to the police. But Blake recalled one time before the shooting when Cody and Grant were over at his house to play video games. While there, Grant had gotten up to go to the bathroom, so obviously he was out of sight for a while. Blake said that Grant knew where he kept his guns and said that you would have to walk past his bedroom to get to the bathroom so he wouldn't have noticed it if Grant snuck into his room. It was a 9mm handgun that killed Chad, Margaret, and Cody, but because the gun had never been recovered, they aren't able to compare the bullets found at the scene to this gun. But obviously, Blake thinks that it is very possible that it was his gun used to murder Grant's family. Because again, there was guns in the home and Grant could have had access to them, but he probably didn't want those guns to be connected to it, so it made sense that he stole another gun. This shows that this could have been premeditated for months. The defense, on the other hand, they said that the police just got tunnel vision and immediately blamed Grant for the murders without even considering any other suspects. They said that they didn't do a good job of processing the evidence and that they had their suspect and made the evidence fit what they already thought instead of letting the evidence lead them to a suspect. They said that the timeline that the prosecution came up with did not add up. They said that the investigators didn't actually know the exact time that each family member was murdered, so the timeline they presented was just made up. 
they pointed to Chad accessing his bank account after he had allegedly been shot, then to a message that was opened and read on Chad's phone after midnight as well. They said that clearly, Chad was alive to access his phone at the time because again, you need your own fingerprint to access it. But again, like I said earlier, it's also just as possible that Grant used his dead father's finger to access the phone as well. The defense said that he didn't have access to the guns in the home because again, he sold all of Cody's guns and Chad kept his guns in a safe in the house. They questioned Blake, who said that his gun had been stolen. They basically said that it would be very irresponsible of him not to notice that his gun was stolen for months after it went missing, which I agree, you should know where your guns are at all times, whether you use them or not, but Blake isn't the one on trial here, Grant is. The defense basically said that Grant didn't have access to the guns, he didn't have, you know, the combination to the safe, he couldn't have stolen the gun, I guess, and he didn't use Cody's guns because he had sold them. They also said that Grant didn't have a motive to kill his family. They said that the family had been very patient with him, which is actually very true. They allowed him to use that $200,000 that he took from them. They said that he was very close with his parents and his brother and that he was okay with the new rules that were set in place for him. Yeah, he made some mistakes and stole some more money and more money and more money and more money from his dad to talk to the girlfriend that he was banned from talking to, but that's besides the point. They were so close. You know, he went to rehab, cost his brother another $15,000, continued to steal money from them and kept disregarding the rules, but... He had no motive. He was close to them and he was chill with the rules as long as his parents didn't find out that he was breaking them, in my opinion. The prosecution obviously talked about the forensic evidence, the blood evidence, everything they found at the scene, the fact that Jason had an alibi, that Cody could not have been responsible. So really, there was nobody else that could have possibly been responsible for this, nobody else who had the means or motive or opportunity. So it had to be Grant. So, after about a week of trial and hearing arguments on both sides, the defense and prosecution made their closing statements. And after that, the jury was sent off for deliberation. On July 31st, 2019, after eight hours of deliberation, the jury came back with their verdict. They found Grant Amato guilty on all three counts of premeditated first-degree murder of his mother, father, and brother. I'm told that the jury has reached a verdict and everyone's present at this point. If you could please go get the jury. You may be seated. All right. I'm told that you all have reached a verdict. All right, if you could please hand the deputy the verdict forms, please. If you could please stand, Mr. Amato. In the Circuit Court of the 18th Judicial Circuit in and for Seminole County, Florida, State of Florida versus Grant Amato, verdict, count one, Margaret Amato. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of first degree premeditated murder. Further finding, we further find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the offense, the defendant personally carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use a firearm or a weapon. Further finding, we further find that during the commission of the crime, the defendant actually possessed a firearm. Further finding two, we further find that during the commission of the crime, the defendant discharged a firearm. Further finding three, we further find that during the commission of the crime, the defendant discharged a firearm and caused the death of Margaret Amato. Verdict, count two, Chad Amato. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of first degree premeditated murder. Verdict, count three, Cody Amato. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of first degree premeditated murder. And by August 12th, 2019, the jury sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility for parole. All right, I'm told that the jury has reached a verdict. Everyone's present, so let's go get the jury. Count one, Margaret Amato. We, the jury, find as follows as to Grant Amato in this case. 
A, aggravated factors as to count one. We, the jury, unanimously find that the state has established beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the aggravating factor that the first degree murder was committed in a cold, calculated, and premeditated manner without any pretense of moral or legal justification. Yes. We, the jury, unanimously find that the state has established beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the aggravating factor that Grant Amato was previously convicted of another capital felony. Yes. Mr. Amato, if you could please stand. All right. As to, and state at this point, any uh, thing that the state wishes to address with the court prior to me sentencing Mr. Amato? Well, just one thing, uh, although it may be academic, um, there is a minimum mandatory that needs to be imposed, 25 to life. So I just ask that the court would just consider that in its sentence. Okay. All right. Based upon uh, this case, 2019 CF337 CFA, the state of Florida versus Grant Amato, you've been found guilty of three counts for killing both your mother, your father, and your brother, Margaret Amato, Chad Amato, and Cody Amato. At this point, you've been found guilty by a jury of your peers who have now indicated that you are not to be sentenced to the death penalty. Based upon those circumstances, the court is limited to one finding and one sentence for you. As to each count, the court would adjudicate you guilty. I would sentence you to life imprisonment without any possibility of parole as to each count. And otherwise, sir, just God have mercy on your soul. Nothing further at this point. All right. Anything further before the court adjourns? There you are. All right. Court's in recess. Of course, after the sentence, he has tried to appeal, but they have been denied as far as I've seen. I think it's pretty obvious what happened here. Obviously, I think that Grant is responsible. I think that the prosecution got it right. I think he became obsessed with this woman who he thought of as his girlfriend. I do think that he was mentally ill. I think he was depressed and I truly think that he just didn't see much point in life. I think that is why he became so addicted to these cam websites and why he became so obsessed with Sylvia. I think that it got to the point that Sylvia was the only thing that he cared about in his life. So when his family banned him from seeing her, he responded by taking them out because they were taking away the one person that he cared about. Again, that way, they could never prevent him from seeing her or talking to her ever again. Obviously, this is just such a sad and tragic case. The amount of grace that his family showed him was just way too kind for him to turn around and murder them like that. I can tell you what, if my sister stole $65,000 from me and $150,000 from my parents to use on internet porn, I don't know if I could ever forgive her, at least until she paid me back let alone continue to let her live with me, which she doesn't, but if she did, she would not be living with me anymore. I wouldn't take her on this nice international trip to Asia, pay for her rehab only for her to drop out, and then wait patiently as she was applying for jobs. Obviously, none of them deserved this. I'm so sad that they showed him so much kindness and forgiveness, and this is how he repaid them. I'm just so sad for all of the lives that were ruined by this pathetic loser. The fact that Jason has to live with the fact that this monster of a brother murdered his family for literally no reason. Cody's girlfriend has to live without the person that she loved and cared for. Every patient who could have been cared for by Cody at the hospital will be robbed of that and his coworkers will be robbed of his smile and his caring personality. Everybody who knew the family their lives are forever changed, and it's all because of some selfish, pathetic loser. I'm sure Grant is sitting in jail. I'm hoping that he regrets what he did, but I also hope that he knows that everybody sees him as this entitled loser who couldn't get a job, 29, still at home, unemployed, not doing anything in his life besides watching porn. I hope he knows how embarrassing and pathetic that is while he's sitting in jail, but I digress. 
That is all I have for today's case. And now I want to know what you all think. Do you agree with the prosecution's proposed motive of him killing his family over Sylvia? Or do you think there was another reason? Do you think that mental health played a big role in this? Let me know any thoughts that you have about this case in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and now I have a TikTok account too as well. All of those will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.